Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews, and convention panels. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Good mid-morning to you. Welcome to, uh, to the Keeping It Real panel. Uh, writing a sexy fantasy world. Uh, my name is Bob Nelson. I'm, I'm actually the publisher behind Brick Cave Media, and I am joined today by. Uh, my name is Bruce Davis. I write science fiction and fantasy, published by Brick Cave Media. It's my latest book, Silver Magic, in the Magic Law series, Lord of the Rings meets Law and Order. Um, and uh, I'm I'm a pretty hard realist when it comes to fantasy, fantasy worlds, and how you create them. And we'll go then to it. My name's Eric Knight. All right, uh, mostly happy fantasy and uh, some action adventure. And um, part of the reason I write fantasy is because I don't have to answer to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love this fact that you guys each approach fantasy from a different sort of angle. Um, talk, I'm, I'm actually just going to take over as a moderator right now. You're good. Um, so you talk got it. a little bit about where you come at fantasy from, and, and let's kind of do some level setting with that. Eric and I've had this discussion a few times. Exactly. Go ahead, <laughs> take it away, Eric. Uh, where do I come at it from? Um, literally, a big part of the reason I started writing fantasy instead of sci-fi is I didn't want to do the research. I had um, written a um, a thriller, a genetic thriller, which was fascinating. But I went down the rabbit hole. I was at the U of A medical library day after day after day and I read stuff that didn't have anything to do with what I was doing but it was fascinating but it was also a lot of work because you got to get everything just right and, and all this and I thought after this I'm going to write fantasy because then if I say in this desert when the wind blows the sand burns it does because I say so now I have a little bit of a science background a scientific reason for it not good enough but I like the idea of being able to do whatever I want at the same time, I'm a huge history buff. So if you start this order and they get this kind of power, they're going to follow the track of like the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages, you know. So I do believe in having your, your civilizations need to unfold in a logical way because history, while not necessarily repeating itself, does rhyme a lot. And so I do think that that's very important, understanding that this is what uh, societies and, and civilizations will tend to do over time is vital, but so you keep it real by making sure that the either the development of your social strategy or everything or the background that leads up to it is right. consistent with what we understand as a as a historical model. right exactly. So um, Eric, kind of a follow up question, right? Because the idea is that you're, you know, the idea that you're creating a real world. How do you then, since you're kind of approaching it from, hey, if the sand burns, right? Wind blows, sand burns. How do you then approach it from other areas to make sure that that feels natural and real to the reader? Like, how how do you feel like okay, everything else is in place, and so this is just the reader accepts this as the reality of this book. Again, leaning heavily, I mean, I, leaning heavily on, on, on history and then human nature, which is consistent time frames and different worlds and everything like that, I think is important. I mean, I, I you know, I, it's, mine is mostly modeled somewhat after a European medieval style, although there's other cultures. I read all these books about the Mongol Empire, and then I've got a people that I can model after them, but never call them that, of course, because they're made up and I can change this, whatever I need to do. But I definitely pick peoples and cultures and time periods, and I, I lean heavily on it. 
but I'm not going to go in and try to get the right name for that kind of shoe they wore or whatever. I'm just going to make that stuff up because uh, I don't want to get bogged down. Right. And and I, I start researching. You're not getting words done, and, and researching can just be its own because it is fun to do, but it bogs you down. Yeah, yes, so, it does. <laughs> so Bruce, in sort of, um, I don't want to say contrast, but no, but I and, and I appreciate I actually appreciate Eric's work because he has instead of this huge monoculture, which you see so much right, in right, right. fantasy, he's got different groups and different cultures, and they do different things. They exactly. don't all talk. The same, right? Problem. They have different, uh, different uh, desire, like cultures. Not, run yeah, not even just different goals, but you know, they have the whole cultural. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that. That makes it more real. Um, one of the things I've always had a problem with epic fantasy is, yes, it's three thousand years, and we're still fighting with swords. Yeah. Are you people stupid? <laughs> um, so this whole series is a reaction to that. You know, we've got all the races of high fantasy, but we're now in a modern world. Right. And then we have a police team that tracks our terrorists and illegal conjurers, but that's a whole thing. But you don't run out of ammo. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, actually, you do, because they only have 16 shots in their magical right. weapons. Um, in any event... Um, I'm a big history fan, too. Actually, I have a minor in history, a major in neurophysiology and minor in history. I'm a very weird student. Um, but I, I think that's one of the, the downfalls of a lot of fantasy writers is that they don't pay attention to history. Exactly. They don't pay attention to why the feudal system existed in the first place. Exactly. I'm pointing at you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> No, George Martin. Oh, yeah. his, his, <laughs> his social organization makes no sense. Yeah. You know, I mean, unless you've got some overlord who's enforcing all of this, it just doesn't happen that way. And that's that's the kind of realism that I think I'm talking about when I say making fantasy real. Um, I, I I get deep into the weeds of how far can a horse travel in a day. Yeah, oh, that one. And, you know, why do you only have, their horses why do you only have one horse? <laughs> if you're seriously traveling long you distances, three. you've got at least two or three. Yeah. you got to have a remount, and you've got to have, you know, so this or, we're going to jump on our baggy horse and ride off. Oh, yeah. It don't work that way. <clears throat> no, I think it helps, and, and like I said, I cheat all the time. I, like, I con a gold to... Goulden's books on the Mongol Empire are just fascinating. And it's not just uh, about, because it's a, it's a fictionalization of it, I mean, using historical characters, but you get such a feel of like what their lives were like, you know, what it was like to live in a yurt through one of those winters. And every you, you barely leave the yurt and you go outside and everyone in your yurt is you're doing their business right here. And in the come spring, you have mounds of frozen poop and everything there that have, you know, because they're not going to go walk 20 minutes that way. They'll die. It's too cold. And so, and just how they, and how they fought and how they, and so taking that and just stealing freely from it and then trying, like, you, we're so used to our American viewpoint where we're very self-centered, what's well, about me, and then other cultures are very much more about the culture, I mean, the group and, and all that. And so, and then just different ways of dealing with, oh, well, you've, You've uh, wounded my pride. Now this has to be settled. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Just steal freely. There's, there's all the variety you can possibly want. It's already in the world. You yeah. don't have to make up stuff. You just go read it and go. All right, I'll change. I literally would take for those people Mongolian names, look them up, and then just change a couple of letters so that they have a feel to it. But I'm not. I don't really want people to go. Oh, that's those are Mongols. No, I. They're not. They're they're Mongols. What do you guys got? Anybody? No. Anybody? No? So, okay. Well, go ahead. One of the things that is making fantasy real is you you have to have enough reality that it doesn't repel your reader. Yeah. That they yeah. buy into the story. Because if you don't do that, you know, well, they go five pages in and say, oh, this. Yeah. So I will say, as a publisher, um, I obviously. Publishing Bruce, I'm on the one end. I have an author very much like Eric on the other end that's like, I don't write science fiction because I don't want to have to deal with it. I write fantasy because I can get to bend the rules and just play with the rules. But the stories are written with a, with a solid foundation 
so that as a reader, you accept that those bends and you accept those changes because they make perfect sense in relation to how well the story is being told. So it's not, you know, it's not the writer asking you to accept something that normally you would be like, well, I don't, that's crap, I can deal with that. Um, but instead, because the story is written well all around that moment or all around that instance, that you actually embrace that as part of what makes that book unique and part of what makes that culture or whatever it is that's created unique. So it's, it's interesting to see you guys as kind of different different ways of coming at this, both having success and achieving that goal of making those worlds real and yeah. making them things that people can get their heads around. Well, it's, it still so comes down to character. Well, character is human, human nature as human nature. Yeah, wherever you are, people are still motivated largely by the same impulses and, and respond in much the same ways. And one, of the, exactly. one of the things that turns me off is in planets like Dune, Iraq, here's this planet that's nothing but a big sand dune. Where did the oxygen come from? Oh, yeah, how did life ever evolve? Well, yeah. you can do a deep dive into that. It's actually explained. Oh, it is. Go yeah, way I never got that you you got to go way deep into the other books and the annexes oh. and the appendices. No, it's, I made it there, there's, a, there's an ecology there that actually... The latest, that way makes sense. The latest yeah. issue of Analog Magazine is just out. It has an article that goes through a deep dive about what it would take to make super dry worlds, specifically like you. Yeah, yeah, there's a... There's a and how do the sandworms find enough to eat? There's, There's nothing purpose. living there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, they, they would eat a person like, oh, I'm hungry an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> Slow digestion. Like yeah, maybe sleep. that's it. They, but they, they sure move a lot. A lot of things that don't move much, that don't need much food, like creatures in the deep ocean, they just don't move very much. Yeah. So around. for each of you, let me ask you this. Uh, for, for our readers in the room, if there was like one of your books that you wanted them to start with that really kind of exemplified this concept of, of that making it real, which book would that be, Eric? Well, I would just pick the first because I have three series that are all in the same world and they interlock and run successively. So I would start with book one, Wreckers Gate, because not just because it's the introduction to the world, but if you're into audiobooks, um, yes. uh, uh, Michael Kramer and Kate Reading are narrating that series for me. They're up to book three now. And they're fantastic. They do Brandon's lot, Brandon Sanderson's work, and so if you like audio, go check those guys because they are oh, they're so good. But uh, that would give you that's the introduction to everything. But they're made so that you can start with any one of them. But that one sets up the who who the underlying villain is in the background for all the series. So it is this. Yes. And for me, it would be Platinum Magic, which is the first book in this series for exactly the same reasons. Sets up the world, sets up the characters. Each of my books is a semi-standalone, meaning yeah, you can read them in any order. It helps if you've read the earlier one for a few pages, but eventually I catch you up pretty quickly. Um, and each has an ending. Yeah. You know, it's not like, oh, we just stopped the story in the middle and you got to buy the next book. No, each of them has a satisfying ending, and I try to emphasize that also I think in in keeping it real because if you're writing a long epic story then write a very long book I, I, I don't like when they take this take a 300,000 word book and break it into two 150s and it's really just one book yeah unless you're going to release them simultaneously yeah. so I can read them all the way through yeah you need to at least or come out very quickly afterwards yeah um, so I, because I don't write that way, I'm not that efficient, <laughs> um, you know, each of these ends. Right. And I think That's that also cool. keeps it real. You know, if you're going to have a problem, you solve your problem. Otherwise you've not finished your story. And something you said earlier triggered uh, some thoughts for me that, that another way to make it real is understand a little bit about biology and ecology and things like this like yeah. like you said oh they got on their horses and they galloped all day that's just stupid unless you they're magical horses or you want to come up with a reason understand a little bit about how the world works because even if you have an alien world which mine is not earth and there's going to be some differences you're still going to have the same 
you know, creatures need habitat. Like I can't come up with a giant sandworm if there's, I, if I can't think of any way they can live, I can't do that. That bothers me. There has to be, everything has to make sense in some way. The sand burns because mixed in with it are little pieces of magnesium. And, and, and um, no, though the rocks have the magnesium, in it's, um, what's it? The, the, Iron oxide. No, the uh, potassium. So pure potassium will burn if it gets cut. So enough of it in the sand, but it's it won't burn until it gets into a whirlwind, and then it will get separated by weight again. I'm sure yep. this isn't scientifically no, but it's, it's close it's enough. Certainly possible. But then it will light up, and then the rocks are filled with magnesium. So when these one of these windstorms like runs into the rocks, you get all these explosions and things. I just did because it, it was cool, but I needed to make some way that it would make some kind of sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. somebody challenged on, me on, on a very cursory level. It makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it does. It does. It Again, it's fantasy. Deep. Nobody's there to say this yeah. isn't Star Trek. I don't have to be like the cutting edge. <laughs> it just has to be enough to where people don't just give up in disgust. Well, I, I agree with you totally about animals, ecology, environment. Um, and, and that bothers me about some worlds that people create because they completely ignore you know, what would the climate of a dune be? What would the climate of an all water world be? You know, yeah, it would be too damn stormy for anybody to live on it. That's yeah. the Star Wars thing is everything's like one, every yeah. world is one thing. Yeah, it's all yeah. one. And, and I love it when an author can take this journey and you're not going through continuous forests or, you know, the deep desert. Yeah. Oh, well, we have the forest, then we get to the little scrubby land, and then we get to the desert and, and there's foothills. You know, and, and there's, yeah, it's, that's part of keeping it real, is keeping your environment and your creatures. There are certain things that biology can't do, yeah. even in fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you guys have anybody that you've read that you really are like, yeah, this person gets it, and they and they're. Uh, I loved Amy Thomas Thompson series. Uh, let's see, the Color of Distance, and then she did. Oh, I forget what the second one's called. I don't think she ever did her third one, but it was very. It was an alien planet where this astronaut gets stranded, and they kind of have to change her into their. You know, it just has a whole biological system. Talks a lot about what they're eating and their culture, and you know, it's not a lot about war. It's more just about fitting in. And uh, and then in the second book, some of the couple of the aliens come back to Earth, and that's fun too to see Earth through alien eyes. You know, so that's, that's one of my favorites. She's the same one that wrote Virtual Girl, but I don't know what I, I haven't been able to find much by her. I don't know what happened. Okay. I think by and large, most of your modern authors, it, we've moved mostly away from having <coughs> rules that don't make sense. I mean, yeah. It's more the older people that I, the older, I'm thinking of who didn't do a good job of it. I'm say older authors. Maybe the audience wasn't as discerning then or not, didn't care. I don't know. I like no, do never make sense. <laughs> Heard of the comment? Heard of the comment. Okay. That was an excellent one where an exile, a group was exiled to a comic and then, uh, set up their own ecology inside and then actually there was a ecology and they ended up morphing in with it. It's very good. There, there was a Kevin Anderson series that was almost like the opposite of that because it was literally set in a tabletop role playing world and there were hexes on the landscape and all the characters <laughs> knew they were in a game world uh, uh. and it were aware that they were characters in this world. And like the magic stones were all polyhedral dice. Yeah. And yeah. so, you, you know, I think you get away with that if there's a reason you're doing it. If, if, if you're doing it, yeah. it's like playing like, Stalzi's red shirts. Yeah. You know, yeah, we know we're characters and we're all going to die. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, look at Conan. It does none of that stuff make sense. He's like, I need a snake monster here. I'm just going to put him in here. He sits in this room until yeah. you get here. But it was a different time. And also, I think if you just. Depends on your audience. If you just make it so much fun, people will go, all right, I'm down. There's a yeah. snake monster in the room. Let's see. <laughs> Let's Kevin. roll with it. Yeah. No, and, and there's certainly a, a style of writing that is made for that kind of right. reader. And, and that's not 
I like that kind of stuff every once in a while, too. It's like, oh, I'll throw away my disbelief just because I want to see you blow things up. <laughs> All right, I got a comment back there. Uh, the Dress and Files by Jim Butcher. It's an urban fantasy, so we have yeah. one day. But there are wizards, but they're limited in number. And there's this explanation of how, ma how magic works, how it's a gathering mm -hmm. and understanding energy. Almost anybody can learn it. You just have to, you know, actually know it exists. And the magic actually follows the laws of physics. If you throw a fireball, it's going to spread like a normal fire. It's not going to go like three feet and stop just because you want it to. Yeah. So ironically, one of the first conversations that I had with Bruce when um, we first talked about publishing Platinum Magic was, okay, so tell me about your world. Mm -hmm. And so he started to explain the magic system to me. I'm like, okay, that's enough. I got it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, again, I, being who I am, it, it's... Very, it's alternate physics. You know, this is quantum magic, and I can talk about it <laughs> mathematically if you want. Um, but yeah, exactly. I, I think there's, I think the cool thing about Dresden uh -huh. is that Butcher acknowledges if this exists, somebody's going to regulate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and there have been a few other urban fantasy, I can't remember particular Rivers ones where. Rivers London does that. Yeah, where, where we acknowledge that the werewolves and the vampires are out there, but by God, we're going to have an, an agency that regulates their activities. <laughs> and the really fantastical creatures literally live in their own sort of pocket dimension, so which has its own laws of physics. So, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily obey Earth. And it's, I think, and you touch on magic. You can have magic, but at least have some kind of internal logic. Yeah. It, yeah. it can be whatever. All magic comes from the foot, the right foot. Okay. <laughs> but how? Why? Like, make it make sense. Don't just... The, the idea that science is almost... I mean, magic is just an alternate kind of science. It has to... It follows its own rules, and, it, and, it's, and it's consistent, <clears throat> internally consistent. Otherwise, yeah. What... what Okay, you're just conjuring things out of thin air right. and going around. Right. Like, no, I, I always like the idea of something I'd seen in D and D long ago. Like in this world, I think it's Dark Sun world. When you use magic, and I've stolen some of this too. When you use a magic, you're drawing from the energy of the things around you. So the bigger it is, like people around you just die. Plants <laughs> die. Everything turns because the energy has to come from somewhere. Magic energy. Where does it come from? Like following the basic laws of. You know, matter and energy not being created or destroyed, you really, yep. if you conjure something, where did that come from? There's got to be a hole somewhere else, to me at least. See, my magical system worked because all magic is earth magic. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's whatever electromagnetic field that the earth possesses. Well, we're so small relative to the earth that we can draw on this and it doesn't matter. Right. And it all goes back to it anyway. <clears throat> But yeah, you have to have, that, again, most magical systems is like, oh, I'm just going to make a bunny. You know, it's like, okay. <laughs> Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, someone that did it well was a TV show called Pushing Daisies. Yeah. 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 They did that very well. I don't forget what book it was. There, there's a whole series that... I can I can resurrect you, but somebody else has got to die. Yeah, there you go. Alchemist, they do that yeah. really yeah. well. And Brandon Sanderson, I, mean, I don't know which books now, but like the whole idea of metals and being yeah. you know, attractive, attraction, oh, and repulsion, and fascinating. Yeah. Loved it, really. Did. Yeah, I steal the books. <laughs> well, you everybody steal. I mean, you just unless you were the very first person. I'm oh, Jules Verne. Nobody's done it before. You whatever. You everybody just, steals from everybody. It's like you can't, yeah, it's impossible. How the serial numbers off from the Exactly. Well, you put a twist on it again. You can yeah. you can you can take all everybody else, but it's just got to twist it a little bit and make it yours because there really aren't any unique ideas. I mean, there's some, I guess the uh, the broken earth ones by. Uh, N.K. Jamison or whatever, mm -hmm. with the way a, a geomancy or something, that certain people, the ability to cause the earth to fascinate, really, really amazing, and, it's hard, and, and it really holds together nicely. It's such a bizarre world, but she did a lot of work. It really makes it stick together. I'm jealous she's so good. <laughs> <laughs> You're reading, it's like, yeah, I can't do this. No, I can't do that either. I, so, so let me ask you guys this: What worlds or what readers have you found that they don't necessarily make it real, but it's good enough 
like Conan, that you're like, yeah, I'm just going to roll with this because I'm having a good time. You remember that Harry Potter? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Um, there's a series I just started that goes back, starts with uh, just one damn thing after another or something. It's like a time travel kind of thing. And it's just a romp, you know? You yeah. just don't yeah. expect So I, I am a big fan of Harry Harrison and the Stainless Steel Rat series. <laughs> yes. Which really is kind of a criticism of his entire science fiction peer group at the time that he wrote them. Um, because his characters just do ridiculous things and get away with them and do like every everything is solved with smoke bombs and, and flash grenades. And he has an endless supply of smoke bombs and flash grenades and he's running around and it's just it's completely like this would never fly in a in a true real world, but you go with it because well he's a good writer and the characters are engaging and mm-hmm. everything else about it is fun so you just yeah. kind of rock and roll with it. Disc world, I mean, Disc oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yet <laughs> this world is just purposely written. Well, to it's parody. Those. It's parody. Yeah. It's it's well, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy yeah. for yeah. fantasy. And, and, it doesn't and, have to make sense. And Disc world started out as super parody. They had like yeah. the Robert and the Great Mouse. Oh yeah, that's why the only ones I've read. But is the first. The thing is, is even in Disc world, as it went on, technology advanced. Society right. changed. Yeah, things changed. Yeah. 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 So what else? What else do you guys want to know? Yeah. The heart of gold uh, with the impossibility drive. So <laughs> yes. yeah. The least likely thing that could happen at any given moment is going to yeah. happen. Yeah. And yet there's something oddly real about that. Yeah. <laughs> the math doesn't add up. Uh, it's that whole karma thing just coming out. Yeah, yeah. Faster than light drive. Yeah, yeah. faster than light drive. Like, yeah, whatever. We can do that. We can do it's it. My book. I'm just kind of <laughs> there, there was a uh, sci-fi webcom called Drive, and the core of the society is built around full drives, basically, in space, which were built by aliens. And the way humans have them is an alien ship crashed on Earth. A guy who had just been fired from his job found it studied it, figured out how to reproduce it, how to steal it up and down. They have no idea how it works. They just know how to build it. reverse engineered it. Yeah, and and part of the thing is that their society has an entire drive core, and if you're not a member of the drive core, which is all his family, you're not allowed to go near the drives, and they will kill you. (laughs) So what is, um, let me ask you guys, what is your, what's the first thing that will stop you uh, in a in a fantasy, if you are reading it, you think oh, this isn't real. I'm not buying into this. A complete ignore, uh, completely ignoring the laws of physics. Okay. Yeah, it, it, you can't destroy energy. You can convert it, but yeah. you can't destroy it. And so many fantasy worlds just you know make a bunny. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. No. A wizard did it. Yeah. A wizard did it. <laughs> no, that drives me nuts. I cannot read those. I will ch- delete or, on occasion, huck them against the wall. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, I, I get upset, frustrated with combat scenes that read really well, except, no, a sword can't do that. No. Uh, no, you can't swing a sword that way for that long, unless you're Superman. Um, no, you're not going to be able to pierce that particular thing that particular way. I get very much into the... You wanted to write a, a, an exciting scene, but you completely ignored how people actually fight and how these weapons actually work, and why they developed the way they did in the first place. Um, and I'm sure you yeah. You encounter that too. I mean, you talk about doing yeah. your historical research. Yeah. yeah. And well, that'll, that'll make you stop right there. Yeah. It's like, or the gun that never runs out of bullets. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah I mean, that's more of a TV trope than. than uh, no, it's in some books too. Well, you, you can either write that the guy, guy stopped to change magazines, or that's just assumed. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that up to a certain point. But. You know, if you're going to have him do, you know, spray and pray, he's going to run out of bullets real quick. Yeah. That's not going to go on for a minute and a half. And your barrel would melt down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a, lot of There's a whole lot of bad things about that. Can't work. 
And actually, that's one of the things that I appreciated about some fantasy writers who, who actually talk about what um, shield wall combat was really like. Oh, yeah. The, the, there's those really good books that were written, the Saxon books. Yes. In our corner. Not, I got a lot Corn, from that. Cornwell. And then stole those shield <laughs> walls. Yeah, like, exactly. How cool. And they're literally getting past it by stabbing the guys in the foot, you know, because yeah. you can't get past that shield wall if it's and, held And proper. Cornwell, you know, is a historian. Yeah. So he's oh, getting yeah. this detail right. And that's, mm-hmm. that's a wealth. He's a good writers. one to get. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, he's got books about Agincourt and like the the, in, the British, the English archers, and get a he's lot written of some of the most harrowing used. combat scenes I had ever. Uh-huh. Had. It's like yeah. I had to stop and catch my breath yeah, at the end of that scene. Good. So, not necessarily like being able to pull energy out of nothing because I don't think about it that way specifically. But if there are rules of a magic system or assumed rules. If shows keep changing, that yeah, 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 yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, like, oh, you have to wave your hands and wave your hands. A thing happens, and then later on in the book, she just stares super intensely, and things happen. Like, that's different. Yeah, you gotta explain yeah. that. It's like the author forgets they created the convention, and then later on ignores it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I have to do a lot of go back, and that was three books ago. What did I say about that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, How did that work? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, dang, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, Tanya Hub, I can't remember the name of the book series, but she had a protagonist. Summon the Keeper, I think. Summer of the Keeper was the first one. And throughout the whole thing, you cannot do X. You do X and bad things happen. Third, second book or third book? She does exactly She that. does X. Don't cross the streams! <laughs> <laughs> no, explanation. no explanation. No one completely flipped on her own oh. magic wing. No. 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 Your wrong. editor should have caught that. Yeah. Uh, well, no, she was building to the point that... This certain character could die because I guess she was in love with him too much, the author. Um, oh. And she killed the entire series. I don't know if she wrote any more books out of it because she wrote herself in a corner oh. so tight she could not get out of it. Yeah. What else? What else What else turned you off? I, and I will say from a... Because the idea <coughs> that the editor should catch that, that's all very true. Um and not to throw Bruce under the bus sitting next to him on the panel. Um, but, um, you know, you're busy creating the book, right? So you're not always 100% cognizant of all of the things that you have been creating. Bob, Bob and his editors have pulled me up short a couple of times. Now. Well, I was like, wait a minute! And that's what we're supposed yeah. to do, right? We're yeah. supposed to come back and say, hey, 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 go look at this, because this doesn't jive with what you've done before. Make sure that there's a reason that you're doing this, and if there's a reason that you're doing it, make sure the reader understands what's happening here. Because if it's not meant to be that way, you already told us it can't be that way over here. So just make sure if you're doing it that you're making it. Or, or even perfect. worse, you kind of implied it can't be that way. Right. I mean, if you make the specific statement, you can't do X, you can go back and look at your own work and say you can't do X. But if I've implied that so-and-so is the bad guy, and then all of a sudden two more books later he's the hero, I better have a pretty good explanation for why. <laughs> if it's from his point of view, he might be. Well, well you're never the right. villain of your own story. But, but that's it, right? I mean, you've got to be able to help the reader get there. Yeah. Because exactly. otherwise, the reader's going to be like, well, that's BS. I'm out of this. One, one thing that turns me off is in horror movies. I can accept, like, a demonic ghost trying to murder people, but as soon as it's some ridiculous thing, like getting your hand mangled in, a, in an incinerator... <laughs> I'm done. Because you can't do that. Box but, to yeah, so like, test you, your you know, there's, there's so I don't know, where some character will get their hand caught in the garbage still just shreds their hand. You cannot do that. They're designed to not do that. <laughs> not just do that. <laughs> You'll tear up your hand. Yeah, you yeah, well, but, you know, the, the other trope is, but don't, don't go into the that. dark basement. <laughs> what are you, stupid? <laughs> don't go into the dark. Leave the house! <laughs> yeah, you can't expect characters to know what genre they're in. <laughs> but, okay, common so, sense is a thing. You've been in all of these, you know, I'll, I'll call them showstoppers. Um, what do you do? What strategies do you personally have, aside from relying on your editor, to help you catch those kinds of glaring errors? Yeah, because I actually don't have an editor because I'm an indie, but I have some pretty great art readers, people that will have read previous ones and will go over with a fine tooth comb. But um, I take lots of notes. Well, by notes, I mean going back through the book and just 
copy sections and put them into a file so I can go back you can and look at the dictionary. So yeah, my, my process tends to pick that up <clears throat> because I'm a very poor typist. Like, oh. And it takes me a long time to get something down. So I'm actually self-editing as I go. And if I've been away for the story for more than a couple of days, I go back two or three chapters and read what I've written to get back into the mode, because I'm, I'm a pantser. I, I don't yeah, know where my stories are going half the time anyway. So I've got to get back into the story, but that helps keep it consistent. And, and actually, um, I've created a wiki around the, each, each book. Wow. So as I like, okay, magic, <coughs> okay, then I'll, I'll throw it into a specific place about the magic system. So that way I can go back and I can say, okay, what, am I put, what notes have I had? about the magic system that I've put aside. So I can just boil through those real quick to make sure that I'm not going back against what it is that I have been saying. Or that if I am, I need to get in there and, and work it and make it work. Otherwise, it's not gonna fly. It also bothers me when authors ignore the severity of the injuries they say they're giving their characters. Mm. I have a whole talk. Yeah. So Bruce, <laughs> as a yeah. trauma surgeon, spends a lot of time talking about that. Bruce, yeah. I I you're not getting down after that. You're staying down. down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is frustrating. Like, you really can't. I mean, it's like, it's 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 over with, like, the horse that runs all day or whatever. Yeah. It's just like, come on, think about it. No, I'm going to get a hip bone. I'm fine. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, and that's it. When you start, like, I want to injure someone, but not injure them and take them all the way out. You start thinking, where would I want to have an arrow stuck in me? I, I, I can give you some very good, good advice good about places. that. There are some very good places, but, you know, you've got to know your anatomy and physiology. Or somebody gets, I hate move, somebody gets shot in the stomach, oh. and they're dead in two minutes. No, I'm sorry, unless you hit an artery, which is unlikely, stomach wounds, and I learned this from reading Western way long ago, are slow, painful. Yeah. You last days mm. because the sepsis gets you and kills you. Yeah. Unless you again hit an artery. Well, but you um, friend that will slit your throat. But again, yeah, yeah. there you go. But it's I'm, yeah, some I'm, I'm understanding that a belly wound in pre-industrial warfare is universally fatal. Yeah, but not is, instantly fatal. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Almost universally. You could get lucky. In the movie El Dorado, there's a scene where a character gets shot in the gut. And his father basically had told him there's no chance, so he kills himself. Mm -hmm. And then the John Wayne character had been shot in the back, and it affects him throughout the movie because the bullet's still oh, in his my, spine. My favorite thing to hate is the Hollywood wound. Yeah. Uh, this was in the cowboy I'm thing. Fine. I'm fine. You get shot right here. I'm fine. This gives me cold sweats yeah, as a trauma sure. surgeon. This is a devastating injury. That's a shoulders. Oh, yeah, this is, you can't get here. There's bones in the way. There's an artery this big that will bleed out in like literally five seconds. Not quite wow. that short, but go to, go to the sink and turn on the water. That's what this artery bleeds like. It makes a noise. And so people get shot here and then they're walking around in a sling. <laughs> you want to shoot your character and have them survive. Through and through gunshot wound to the right chest. You may collapse your lung, but you live a long lung. If you don't get sepsis, the lung will seal and reinflate and you will survive. Um, you want to take them out of action for a while but not kill them. Lateral thigh. There ain't nothing out there but muscle. Hurts like hell, but yeah. you're not going to die. Yeah, I heard an assassin character say the subclavian artery was a place to make a fatal strike. Yes. Oh, well, well, operators are taught downward strike into the space right here with a six inch blade. It's going to lacerate every major artery in your body, and it's universally fit. Well, there was a, this is off genre, but I was rewatching the identity theft recently, and Maureen McCartney gets hit by a car, rolls over it, and then gets up to walk away. And I was just like, okay. That's my other favorite is the rollover accident. Yeah. You're not walking away from that, guys. No. Uh, even if you're unhurt, you've yeah. just been tackled by a 300-pound lineman. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times. Yeah, because a friend of mine got hit, just bumped by a car, and it was like a major thing, you know? So. Sir? There's a bit of history that helps. Uh, the old Romans considered that a, that a wound, a palm white that went deep in any major spot, and that's above the knee and uh, all the way up is fatal. 
the, the Roman legionaries, big digression here, actually got better care than a Civil War soldier. They had, they had medics. They had battlefield medics, the restaurarii. They fought in the third rank of the legion. Legion fights in three ranks. You got cut down in the front rank. Your buddies would shove you back with their feet <laughs> until the restaurarii guy could pick you up and take you to the aid station, which was right behind the lines, where the Roman surgeon would then determine, are you going to die or can we save you? So let me, let me shift gears a little bit, because um, one of the other things is climate. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. and how um, a lot of times in fantasy worlds the climate is consistent regardless of where the character is it's always sunny in the forest <laughs> it might rain once in a while if you want your character to be miserable but, <laughs> yeah, but it never it's floods <laughs> yes. that's not just having some kind of basic understanding of how climates work like really again you should know something about how the world works how does biology work how do climates work what does wind, what, what is wind? You know, if, oh, well, it's just always windy. Why? Where is it? Is, it these are going from one point, point to another. Because, Why do you get these Yeah, winds? because the air is rising, because it's even uneven heating and cooling. And I, I just, it's, yeah, it's, it's frustrating because it takes so little. And you should have learned that in school, a lot of it, and have some kind of idea about how these things work or how the various geological, geographical zones will shade into one of them. Mm-hmm. You just have to drive exactly. across the country to get that. Yeah. You just have to drive here north 100 miles and, you know, you can see that happen. Yeah, right. Or up a mountain. So one, one of the best bits of advice that I got about research came from a special ed teacher who was actually talking about high school students. And he was like, send your students to the children's section of the library to read a book about it because it will introduce them to all the major concepts and terms in minutes. And I'm like, oh, climate, yeah. Yeah. go get a kid's book. Yeah. And yeah. you know all that stuff. Evaporation and rainfall and you know the cycles and things and just understanding that. I yeah. can't remember the book because it was ages ago, but they fucked up part of the planet because they blew up a large chunk of land and it changed the climate on everything. And that's all anybody ever talked about was, oh my God, you know, back in the day, it didn't used to do X because this was here. And an entire area turned into desert because, um, I can't remember why, but it, the climate made sense. And I loved that, but that was a book I read like well, 30 that was years what, ago. That was one of Tolkien's big, like, I love that. Yeah. I'm going to make a volcano erupt, and that's going to take this entire region <laughs> forever and make it useless. And it should be really, really burdened. Um, yeah, yeah, have to tell yeah, Well, it's also surrounded by a very <coughs> wall of mountains. So. Yeah, yeah. And I well, think that it's still spewing <coughs> sulfuric acid yeah. and stuff. Yeah. The, 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 the geology of the Middle Earth makes no sense. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> off run. I, Rivers have to run up Joe in order to be able to get there. But well, no, I yeah. think back in, you know, fit, when these early writers were working, I, I don't think our populace was quite as educated on a lot of these things. And the access to information. I mean, I just remember in the 80s and 90s, we just believed things we were told because I got to go all the way to the library and figure it out. And now I can just, I say something and somebody's like, magic answer oh, you're wrong. Ah. You're wrong, there it is. I'm like, dang, yeah, I'm wrong again. And that's it. So it's become much easier. And so I think we have to be more skilled now because people are more demanding. I think also when you're talking about the readership for those, I say, earlier fantasies, I know I was introduced to Tolkien when I was in junior high grade school. It was, oh, I've never read anything like exactly. this. Exactly, yeah. And I didn't care about it. Well, and plus the, the was, characters are so compelling. Right. That you really, uh, they could have spent the whole time in a white room and I would have still followed them and, along and because it was enjoyable. I was blown away the first time I read Dune in high school. Rereading it now, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> no. <laughs> This isn't working for me right now. So I, I think you're right. Your your readers and your readership becomes more and they'll call you out on it too. Not necessarily oh, yeah. educated, but becomes exposed more to a variety of things in the entertainment world, some of which is crap, but some of which actually gets it right. 
And then you're, they're like, well, wait a minute. In this, they said this, and you're not doing that, you know? I got chewed out for having a character drink out of a China cup because China is a specific <laughs> kind of porcelain, and I should have said porcelain cup. I'm like, Whoa. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, yes, I won't do that again. Oh, I, sorry. I, I wrote a, <laughs> well, I just didn't. I, I, I wrote a short story. I got called out because my Civil War character was carrying an Enfield. And it's like, no, 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 no. Oh, the Confederate Army had Enfields. That's one reason I won't write the thrillers, you know, the gun-based yeah. stuff, yeah. because I'm not a gun person, and those people are going to jump. Oh, yeah. They'll be like, that gun doesn't fire at that rate. It doesn't do blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, I wonder what's the notes. SEAL Team 6 explains for like he said the cover artist changed the guns. Oh. He said this is the kind of gun they're supposed to carry. And the guy, he, he said like there was a different skill point. And he said, oh, they look scores. He says, you don't understand, but people who read these yeah. guns, <laughs> they will really crucify yeah. You can't get any of that wrong. And they made, they changed, they changed it so it fit. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't do that. No, I, I, I'm totally behind that. Mm-hmm. I, it's, yeah, it's one of the reasons that I <coughs> went to science fiction and fantasy because I, I'm not one of those guys. If you do it wrong, I'm calling you out, <laughs> and I don't want to be on the other end. Of that. <laughs> so, what other questions do you guys have? All right, I'm gonna let these guys sell their books then. So, uh, Eric, what books do you have here that people can buy? Uh, well, not here. I didn't bring any. I was just at a five day writers conference and I'm frazzled completely. But um, they're all on Amazon. Uh, put the T in because uh, there are other Eric Knights out there, and some of them are writing some pretty weird things, and it's not. Really <laughs> So I've got three three epic fantasy series and then uh, an action adventure series that's set in the Old West with the, uh, it's kind of a, a mood of like the, the Brendan Fraser movie, The Mummy, or Indiana Jones in that it's, uh, it's a happy patchy gunslinger who just gets into one scrape after another and his horse named Coyote who, you know, eats people's hats and <laughs> fights with the other horses and those were my books I would write when the fantasy would be too, too much. I could go, go have fun with those. And speaking of realism, like I love the Old West because every, a lot of people think they know what it's like, but they really don't. So I make up stuff all the time, like sayings. And people then write, they're like, I love how authentic it is. <laughs> it's a, meaner than a skunk with a bad tooth. Like, I've just made up a Western story. They're super easy and they're fun. I mean, we, we have this idea that comes, that's the other thing about realism. You're fitting in what people think is real. What do they think a dungeon is like? It's not what a dungeon would really be like. Right. It's what they think. Right. And then you need to remember there's a difference between am I trying to get exactly perfect or am I trying to give people what they expect? That's what I thought you were going to say. So, go ahead. Um, my books, uh, at least in this series, the Magic Plus series, are available at mostly books from Brickhead Media. Uh, my other books, I have a few indie books, uh, including my nonfiction Dancing in the Operating Room uh, are available on Amazon, but put the C, Bruce C, because yeah. there's another Bruce Davis who writes Baptist religious tracts, and that ain't me. That's not <laughs> yeah, that's... All right. Well, so, yeah. I'll give you back the eight minutes of your time. Yeah. 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 Uh, you guys mentioned magic having effects, and then later on you mentioned weather. Have you ever seen any stories where magic affects the weather? I what was it? There, there, there's a whole series where weather mancers oh. can affect the weather. I was never very... I, I could Clear suspend this belief because yeah. it was kind of a fun story, but it's like, how the heck are you doing? I know the forest had that, where they were singing to the frogs to get the rain, and then it rained. That's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> How about the winds four quarters? Like that? Yeah. That, uh, that might be what I'm thinking Wins about. Winds four quarters, Baltimore? Or, no, I think yeah. it might be Robin Hobbs. Oh, okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Rachel Kane was a series of Baltimore Masters. You've never met it. I think. Like weather seems like that would be one of the hardest things to control. In fact, it seems like you could 
maybe yeah. mess with the weather, but then controlling the weather? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're talking chaos. I'm start here. a storm here. And, oh, dear. <laughs> you never know. Like what, what, what are the, yeah, the ramifications? Because the weather is so unpredictable. Like, but, yeah. we'll just do this. No. Yeah. You can't <laughs> just do that because that's going to... People are using silver oxide to try to create rainfall, you know, with particles. So that's sure. just going on now. Yeah. And we don't hear it, much about it. it because it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, All right, we got two more. So yeah, On the weather part, in Eddings to Bulgaria, um, there's a little piece in there where oh, yeah. the protagonist, the young, young gentleman, uh, messes with the weather, and then his grandfather basically shows up and just tears them all in the mass all the houses. You know, realize I just, me and my like, two brothers or whatever but I spent like three months trying to fix everything you <laughs> fucked up by just not making it rain that day. <laughs> and it's like awesome. you don't do that. Yes you can do that, but it screws everything up because everything's connected together and yeah. that's when we're talking about limits. People say you have to know your limits. Just like um, uh, in the end I'm sorry if it's been also long I wrote it for you, I'm sorry. In the end, one of the one of the antagonists basically tries to wish something away, and all of them you're told you cannot destroy things. Yeah. And sure enough, the guy says, "Be gone!" and he freezes as he realizes he screwed up, and he just basically turns into dust and moves away. Because that's the, <laughs> the universe basically says it just basically bounces back, and he just basically ceases to be. But but, but it had really good rules and limits, hard limits, and lessons about when you cross limits, shit gets fucked up. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that. And, it's one thing to have your hard limits, yeah. but then to have, oh, there's a lot of yeah, right. and, and, and it was very, and it kept on, it says, why can't you do this, right? The will and the word is like, because if you do this, yeah. if you do it, there's a price to be paid. Are you ready to pay the price? Because yeah. you do cool shit, and as long as you stay inside the box, yeah. you do cool shit. But if you're trying to do something really outrageous, mm -hmm. be ready for an outrageous price, or, you know, yeah. it really yeah. comes apart. Yes. I, there was a couple old stories of the analog where a fellow assumed that yes, you could control the weather, but a specific weather event had to be started by a core of guys working to change solar emanations sometime before. Yeah, mm. so, yeah. so the idea that things are interconnected. Yeah. 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 It was cool. a big job. All right. All right, well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please check out D&D Journey of the 5th Edition and Ragnarok and roll a Scion Hero to Ragnarok Story. Also, check out our Patreon page for more content and behind-the-scenes things, as well as joining us for a one-shot game or two.